Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for peace and prosperity for the city that we love. We hope that you give the governing body and city staff the wisdom to make good decisions for the city of Goddard. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, of the agenda. You guys have any comments? Motion, motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Brent. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Appointments, proclamations, recognition of Planning Commission Chair Doug. Where is it? There you are. There it is. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> you want me to control or you want to run it? Okay, doing citizens' comments first. Oh, we got to do. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, all right, well then, we'll do citizen comments. Is there anybody from the audience that would like to speak for three minutes? Please come up and state your address and your name. Good evening. My name is Diane Hilburn. My husband Steve and I live at 2450 South 208th Street, West in Goddard. In 2017, a similar rezoning request was brought in front of this group for, by a different developer. As with the 2017 request, the neighbors most impacted by the dense packing expressed a request for the city council to deny the rezoning request. You listened to our concerns then and made the decision to deny the request. My husband and I, along with many of our neighbors in this room, <coughs> hope you will once again vote to deny the rezoning request. The issues identified in 2017 are the same concerns that you're going to hear tonight by myself as well as my neighbors that choose to speak. The two most prominent issues are public safety and flooding. The developer is proposing three entrances to the development. One is off the southwest corner of 23rd Street and two are off 215th Street. As you know, the speed limit on 215 is currently at 55 miles per hour. It is heavy with semi-trucks that are coming and going to the Dillon's Distribution Center. These are going all days, all hours of the day and the night, and they're just trying to get there. The increased semi-traffic makes it difficult to exit off of 215 onto Kellogg. I personally sat at the inter intersection uh, well over 10 minutes just trying to turn right or left. With trucks parking along the road, it makes it even more hazardous as you can try to navigate around the various trucks coming and going. You now throw in a development with two entrances flowing into the 215, into that traffic, and you are introducing a very hazardous situation, especially if you have teenagers trying to drive, leaving the development to get to school or any other place they're going. We've already had fatalities on 215 in Kellogg involving teenagers and semi-trucks. Do we really want to be responsible for more? Some residents of the new development will probably find 215 too hazardous and would default to the entrance at 23rd Street. As you may know, the north side of 23rd is maintained by the city of Goddard, but the south side is maintained by the township. Needless to say, this road is not well maintained and struggles to handle the current volume of traffic as it is. It is also seeing a lot more semi-traffics moving down it as the truck drivers are trying to avoid the congestion at 215 in Kellogg. There's a pothole on 23rd, if you've ever driven down that, that is persistent. Even when it gets filled in, it's persistent because that road was <coughs> not designed to handle the kind of volume of traffic that's currently on it. Now we're going to throw in a new development with dense packing and you have the potential of shutting that road down completely because it just cannot handle that volume. 
The more significant, another significant issue is the land in question is a flood zone. Both on the southeastern side of the, of the property as well as the far, the far western edge. While we understand engineers are required to mitigate this, the effect of the additional runoff, there is no guarantee to those impacted that it will be sufficient nor successful. A failure would be devastating to those who are in the path of, wa of the water. The, sa the same issue was highlighted in 2017. At that time, we were told the city council would investigate the issue and identify a solution. My understanding is it has not occurred. We're not opposed to this development. We we're just asking that it be more considered to the various issues that result from this densely packed developments and more responsible development taking place, not just on the land, but around Goddard. Having conversations with the schools, let them know your plans. You want development around Goddard because you believe families want to live here because of the school system? Great, but consider this. The schools are already either close to or at capacity. You currently have a newly densely packed development going on the southeast side of Goddard. Eventually, you are going to overwhelm the school system to the point where quality teachers are not going to want to come and teach here. Yes, the school board would probably do a bond drive to try to raise funds. If passes, think about where those schools would be, need to be developed. Ma when the you're going to need to wrap it up. I am. I am. I am. Speak. I am. When the school board needed new schools in the past, they were developed along 167 from <coughs> Kellogg, and now known as Eisenhower. Why dense packed on the west side when they just have the bus, you have to bus now the kids over to the east side. We're asking you to deny this rezoning and encouraging this developer <coughs> to blend in with the existing neighborhood. The homes on 23rd tend to be the upper end of 300,000 on five to 15 acres. Encourage this developer to be more responsible and put in homes that are more comparable <coughs> on one and a half to uh, half to one acre lots to help them to blend in with what so we're not putting more of that traffic on 23rd and creating more of a hazard to our our family your job is to protect and to do what's right for the city and the citizens of the city so i hope that you will take this in consideration and vote no to uh, authorize this rezone thank you for your time please yeah. sign uh, your name and address on that sign in sheet please I'll take it in the left. I will. During this session of citizen comments, we will gladly listen to the citizens of Goddard's comments. We want your input, but we do ask that you respectfully keep your comments to three minutes. There are a lot of you to speak. I know we all have jobs to get up for early in the morning, so I would ask that you keep it to three minutes, please. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else that would like to speak? Thank you, ma'am. Yes. State your name and address. Uh, Rod Stoll, uh, 21710 West 26th Street South, me and Goddard here. Um, I, I really echo what Diane said here, and I, I do believe that rezoning that is is totally wrong. When I purchased my house, it was single family home zoning, and now down the road, if we're putting duplexes in, and if they're anything like the duplex we have behind the Ace Hardware store, that is not eye appealing at all. So it's something I'm going to have to drive by. Family's going to drive by. Um, last time we had the meeting, they said it's really not going to affect your home value. Well, I'd, I'd have to call you on that one because it is going to affect the home value. Everything around us affects our home value. Um, and having a duplex and a very densely populated area like that, it's not going to do us any good. It's not going to help me, not going to help my neighbors. Um, if I'm okay with them building there build single family homes like it's zoned for now and we all wouldn't be here right now it'd be it'd be fine but I just do not see where this town needs more duplexes or 
low income housing is what it's basically going to be. It's what it was stated in the last meeting. Um, we, we just don't need it. And before we do it, we ought to think about getting another grocery store, more items here for people. We don't have the infrastructure in Goddard to handle what we have. I'm sure you all go to Walmart now like I do and the shelves are empty already. Um, moving people in here, we, we don't have the infrastructure that we should have. So, but I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. <coughs> Uh, my name is Alvin Dotson, Dr. Alvin Dotson, 611 South Spruce, Goddard, Kansas. Um, I'm kind of winging it here. There's been a lot of times that I've told myself, you've got to brush stuff up that I need to be here. I need to be here. I've, been, I've lived here for two years. The reason I live here is I have a five-year-old. Um, I also have a 16-year-old that goes to West High, so there's some things that people talk about that's coming here that I understand is a concern, but those people need to have a place to stay also. Um, but with that being said, with my five-year-old, I moved to Goddard for a reason and my daughter's school was the one right off 23rd and so we're going to start having issues with things police have to deal with um, some of the stuff that i keep hearing why we're not getting some of these other things like bar grills uh you know some that they're trying not to turn into wichita kind of keeping the country feel that we have here um you start bringing that in and we're going to start getting some of some of the not goddard not the small family stuff um again i think they need a place to live but i think the area you're looking to zone it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Why would we put it next to the school, any of our schools? I mean, we've separated them and you got, I think the pride of Goddard when I came here and looked was, I'm really happy with what my kids have to go to school and she can ride her bike to school and I can walk her to school and she can find a friend as she gets older and get to school. I'm not gonna feel that way if we have what you're zoning over there. I mean, we all know, you got police officers here. We all know what's gonna happen when that comes in, whether you wanna talk about what it's going to do to my house prices at this moment that's the least of my worries you know so it brought me here so i'm passionate enough to say that i just don't think that it's a good idea at all i don't think that putting it right next to that school is where it should be i mean we got other land all, all around us i don't know why we put it next to there so that's it okay thank you thank you Anybody else? you're next up <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak again this evening. Uh, I spoke to this back in 2017, and I spoke at the Planning Commission last week. My concerns are primarily uh, sorry, against this. I'm sorry? You need an address. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Mark Lewis. I live at 416 Richard Road. Um, I live right across the street from the Clark Davidson Elementary. Uh, <clears throat> I, have a, I have four children that attend Goddard schools, and uh, my concerns are safety. Uh, as well as the traffic issues on 215 as well as 23rd. Um, <clears throat> you know, back in 2017, we had, the, had all the same issues uh, as well as the flooding, but, uh, you know, I, I, they say that the flooding issue will be taken care of. Hopefully, hopefully that will be the case. Uh, they say that, uh, you know, the, the developer, at one point the developer indicated that he wanted to move here. Well, you know, that was 2017. He didn't, he never moved here. Uh, my concern again is, is is the safety of our children and as well as the traffic on 215 I uh, uh, I'm sorry I'm being redundant I realize that um, I would just like to point out that uh, uh, you know the, the people in this room are the community that you guys serve and I would like I would just really pray that you guys would take the considerations of this community our community into consideration uh, the developer they don't live here uh, you know they're they're just trying to make money in in this community I understand that that's great I think res, you know single residential homes would be you know I understand that we need to do we need we do need to develop we need to continue to grow as a community but I don't think 92 acres of multifamily homes is really the solution 92 acres potentially what four acres maybe three homes per acre Three, three duplexes per acre. Do the math. That's that's a lot of duplexes. I, I don't think that that's really the development that Goddard needs. I don't think that that's really their intention. But they said 40%. That's 400 homes times 
let's say for you know I mean do, if you do the math just think about the amount of traffic alone that that generates onto 215 and uh, 23rd Street I just ask you to really consider the safety and and the traffic quality and the quality of living <coughs> for this community please thank you so thank you Next up, state your name and address. <clears throat> My name is Dawn Gins, 21715. What's 26th Street South? Um, just something as I'm hearing everybody talk, which is a lot the way we all feel the same. Something I don't think anybody, I don't know if anybody knows or not, but you cross between Goddard and Sedgwick County on planning, and there has, there's a hundred duplexes going in south of Eisenhower High School. I don't know if anybody knew that, but I don't know if we have a lot of demand for duplexes or whatever, but I think single family homes, if you're looking Goddard as a community, and I know it's Sedgwick County versus city, all that stuff, but um, I think that, like everybody's concerns here, we need more single family homes, maybe large lots or something like that, that I, I don't know how the school's gonna keep up with the demand and all the concerns of everything else everybody's brought up, but just a point I wanted to bring up too that I didn't know a lot of people know about. So, that was it. Thank you, Don. Uh-huh. Who's next? Sorry. No worries. This is counting out of my time? Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need that much time because I echo everybody else's uh, sentiments here. My name is Jana Driscoll, 21025 West 23rd Street South. I live on five acres and it's a single house family home along with most of my neighbors again we agree that possibly you could develop across with you know single family homes but not I mean the way this they want to do this is not what we want, want to live across from I have four main concerns increased traffic it will require more road maintenance and more traffic safety concerns um, the property is a flood zone and unless the factor that factor is at the forefront of the developers mind which we all know that it won't be flooding will continue to <coughs> arise the majority of individuals living at the duplexes will be short-term renters and they do not have the same level of investment in the property as the owners do that or when you buy a single family home there's nothing to prevent the developer from selling the property to a slumlord in 2017 um, the city considered a nearly identical rezoning application and ultimately denied it by listening to our concerns. Again, tonight I ask that you please listen to your constituents and you, you listen to what we are saying. We do not want this. You know, if you go around and you talk to people like um, the post office, they can't handle, they're like, we don't know what we're going to do. We couldn't handle any more. Um, the influx of new people coming in is overwhelming this small little city that was not this way when I moved here 12 years ago. So, Merry Christmas, and please <laughs> My name is Tracy Leadham, and I live at the corner of 23rd and 215. Address is 2415 South 215. <coughs> and I'll just tell you right now, I don't talk well in front of adults. And I do get, I'll sound like I'm really emotional and I'm about ready to cry, but it's just that intenseness of that um, portraying a message. Agree with everything that's been said here, but there's a big concern of the traffic. I've had six or seven vehicles in my front yard due to the amount of traffic that's increased over the last 23 years. The number of people that have died, the number of people that have been hurt, barely wrapped around a telephone pole is very concerning. The number of semi-trucks that go down that road that didn't used to go down that road is alarming. My biggest concern with you rezoning is you're giving this developer an open ticket to be able to go in and change and put in there whatever types of homes they want or duplexes. 
What we're asking you is we understand it's zoned in R1. We get that. And we're not opposed to single family homes. But we are opposed to giving him an open ticket that he doesn't have to be held accountable for what he puts in there. So that's a major concern. And just in some of the presentations so far, there's been some inconsistencies. Originally, it was, it was promoted as an 80-20 mix. 80-20 single family homes, 20% duplexes. Now we come to another meeting <coughs> and it was 40-60 and oh, we're gonna put the, <coughs> the lower priced houses closer to 23rd and we're gonna put the higher priced houses up here by the walking path. Well, if I'm gonna <coughs> spend $300,000 on a home, I don't want people walking by my backyard. So I definitely, as far as that, I understand it's their development, but it's just in some of the thinking that's going on there. So with those consistencies <coughs> and inconsistencies that I've seen so far mentioned about this particular development, I would have great concern and what, how much is it gonna take for them to lift up, sell it, sell it to somebody else, move on. And once you open that zone two ticket or that R2 ticket, it's done. There is no recourse. So that to me um, was just a huge, huge <coughs> red flag in rezoning it to an R2 and allowing that duplexes to go in there. So I think those are some, some major issues that we need to look at as well as the others that have been mentioned. Thank you. Okay, who would like to speak next? Okay. Go ahead. Go your name and address? Uh, my name is David Garden, and I live at 2728 South, 215th Street West. And uh, we've lived out there for 28 years. I'm a general contractor. I've been a builder for 32 years, and I've been in the construction field for 40. Um, uh, about the development, um, we knew this day was coming. We've lived out there for 28 years, and I'm surprised it hadn't been sooner. But um, as far as the R2, uh, zoning that I just I just can't quite understand that um, any good developer can take that land and make really good money but if if it's zoned R2 you can make awesome money because there's residual income from that for years to come and that's the big draw with the R2 um, a lot of the other concerns we've all known that um, 215th Street West and 54 it's a bad intersection and it's going to be really bad if not impossible if this goes through like this um, we know it's going to develop but if anyone is in here has gone by the uh, arbor creek development that's a class act so if you drive through there and take a look at that the way it's done that we have no problem with that at least i don't if it's going to develop drive through arbor creek and take a look at that that's how it should be done without without the r2 so uh, there's a lot of other there's a lot of other issues i can't really think of anything really positive with the r2 um, they're going to be rentals they don't have any skin in the game those folks don't um, uh, it's going to be a revolving door around there so that's that's the other thing too so um, like i say if you want to look at a first class edition look at arbor creek that's really how this needs to go and you know if, if if they don't want to do it like that then maybe they can find somewhere else to put those duplexes so that's all i have thank you thanks who else would like to speak Hi, my name is Curtis Kidwell and I live right across the street at 21101 West 23rd Street South and last week I came and I talked to the uh, Planning Commission and spoke about the, the mission statement for the community development 
Tonight I want to talk to the zoning regulations of the City of Goddard, specifically Article 1, Section 101, Paragraph A, on purpose. The purpose to promote the public health, safety, morals, comfort, general welfare, and to protect and control the aesthetics of redevelopment and new developments. Last week I talked about aesthetics. Other people here tonight have too. Uh, they've also talked about safety. I want to concentrate on one word, morals. Now, what is morals? Morality. Uh, Webster defines it of re relating to principles of right and wrong and behavior, uh, conforming to a standard of right behavior, capable of right and wrong actions. Does morality even belong in politics? Well, apparently we must still think so. We started this meeting off with the Pledge of Allegiance and a prayer where we uh, ask the Lord's help to do what's right and best for the city of Goddard. So, let, but most of us realize that there's been some morality issues with this council and the office of mayor over the last couple of years. The former mayor resigned over charges for counterfeiting uh, Zubilee tickets. Our current mayor was arrested last month for uh, suspicion of uh, driving under the influence. Uh, some things that we need to be aware of moving forward is trying to be more moral, to be um, upright and doing the right thing. Um, what's this got to do with the property? Good question. We know that that property is owned by Jedco Limited Liability Corporation. Well, who is Jedco? We can look at um, the Kansas Secretary of State paperwork and see that they're a limited liability company at 10180 Southwest Boulevard. Looking further, we can see that that property is owned by the Dugan siblings. Uh, in particular, Dwayne Dugan. Why do I single him out? Because he also owns a limited liability company at 101080 Southwest Boulevard in Wichita, Kansas called uh, Fiberglass and Composite Technologies, LLC. Now, if I go to the website of Fiberglass Technologies and uh, Composites and Technologies and look under Meet the Team, I see Dwayne Dugan, the owner. Next to him is a picture of Mary Larkin, who works for Dwayne under um, the accounting. And so now I'm not suggesting anything improper. But um, Mayor Dugan, or Mayor Larkin, uh, on November 1st said recused himself. Great, good job. But in the same paragraph also said that he had no um, actual conflict of interest. I think public opinion might see that differently, that the guy who pays your, your salary also is the owner of, of the LLC that stands to make lots of money with this uh, development. So I ask and I'll finish here, is that I task you tonight um, with avoiding potential improprieties, additional moral uh, tarnish on the city council and the office of mayor, and vote for what is right and what is moral. And I'm reminded by what Lincoln said at Gettysburg, that he was worried about a government of the people, by the people, and for the people uh, perishing from this earth. We are the people in this community. We're speaking. Are you listening? Uh, please uh, do the right thing when you vote to later tonight. Godspeed with your vote. Merry Christmas, and thank you for your time. Amen. Okay. Who else would like to speak? Yes. Howdy y'all, my name is Casey Jo Gimmel and I live at 21111 West 24th Street South. And I moved out to Goddard four years ago and I was unaware of what had previously been proposed but when it, I moved after the fact. But that gave me peace of mind because I'm a country girl from Oklahoma, life brought me to Wichita, but I knew that Goddard was the feel that I wanted for my family. I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old. My son attends Oak Street Elementary and my daughter will be there next year. 
and I can tell you there's lots of information that everyone else shared tonight but I want to share a feeling y'all may not be country people but where I live I've got five acres I've got a pond and a shop and it feels <coughs> like home and Goddard feels small town duplexes and a whole bunch of people does not feel small town to me and it would make me want to vacate even quicker and not to throw anybody under the bus that's lived out there for 20 plus years but if we're talking about growing this city young families want to come out here and I am also in the real estate world people don't want itty bitty lots they want larger lots as Diane mentioned maybe one acre one and a half acre two acre lots whatever it may be I realize that's less money for the developer however let's look at quality over quantity and think about the people that we want in this community I never thought I'd be in Wichita but Goddard made it feel a heck of a lot more like home so all I ask is you think about what type of of families and what type of people do you want to draw to this community and I got a long list of buyers that want big old lots nobody wants to buy a duplex thank you Merry Christmas who else would like to speak tonight I'm Glenn Ming. I uh, live at 2011 South, 215th Street West. Um, I just have a couple questions. When we had the planning meeting, I was there, and one of the members brought up the question of uh, if they failed, they went belly up, would it still continue to be R2? And his comment was, yes. So then the planning commission, they, they were saying, well, we could do an overlay and that would protect the city uh, on where the duplexes could be. But when they asked the city attorney at that time, he said, I don't know if you can do that or not. So I'm wondering, did we get an answer to that? Can they do that? And would it hold up in the court of law? I've, I've heard of protective overlays before, even with the city wish on the Ryan and you. I, I don't think this is supposed to be. I think thing. it'll be addressed okay. later. Okay. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll address that later. And I guess that's my second question. Um, when we had our meeting before, our, we all got to speak, and that's fine. And we appreciate that. We really do. And then after we got done, he spoke, and it appeared to me like he was speaking on behalf of the Dugan because things came out during his presentation that not everybody really understood. So I'm wondering why are we doing the same thing here? Why isn't he going first and we going second? Who gets to call that? Well, this, that? this is citizens' comments. Just it's the way it goes. We're allowed to speak, and when we conduct business, that's when he has to answer questions. Okay. So, but so when we, we tried to ask questions will, last time, we weren't allowed to ask questions we will, later. We will be asking him the questions that are troubling us. Okay. This. Okay. All I got. Thanks. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Larry Turnus. I live at 510 South Walnut, which is just kind of catty corner from Clark Davidson School. My wife and I built that house there and moved in in 1987. So we love the area. <clears throat> uh, all three of our kids were raised there. The one thing that I want to mention, uh, and I'll try to be very brief, I was on the school board here for 12 years. We, uh, when Clark Davidson School was constructed, we weren't living there. We were living there at the time, but it was a closed street. It wasn't open all the way to Kellogg. And consequently, we thought we had a nice, quiet neighborhood because it kind of dead ended there at Walnut. And <clears throat> lo and behold, the school district made a decision to build a school right across from us. And that opened up the street to Indianapolis 500. And I will just remind you all that two of my neighbors were killed 
on the street just down the block from me by some young man I don't know whether he was on drugs or what but speeding and killed two of my neighbor, elderly neighbor men one was a school teacher here until he retired and their dog and that was on Walnut Street I would ask you to think about that and then finally what I want to mention is when we were putting a, an addition which the gentleman that uh, built that addition in with Descon, Steve Shepard is here this evening uh, one of the issues that we continued to fight was water. We had water in the plenums constantly, and it took years to try to rectify that problem. And I don't know if it's been rectified to this day or not, and that was specifically because of that water table. And, so, and that's on a flat piece of property. And you're talking about building duplexes or even somewhere down the road, multifamily homes with basements. I don't think I'd want to put a home in there with that water table. And I would have to be darn well convinced by the engineers that they had thought this clearly through and solved the problem and guarantees that it wasn't going to cause problems for future homeowners or for duplex owners. So please take those things in your consideration and I'd encourage you to vote no. Thank you. Anybody else? Good evening, uh, Sean Hollis, 20811 West 23rd Street, South Goddard. I know some of you here, and if you know me, you know I like to talk a lot. Um, tonight I've been listening a lot, and so I will just echo all of the things that people have said tonight and just want to state it for the record that I'm against the development. I moved out to Goddard so I could have a house in the country, and uh, development is fine. I agree a lot with what David Garden said about um, something along the lines of Arbor Creek, but please don't let duplexes go in and be built in that field. Thank you. Anybody else? Hello, my name is Amanda Ford Hudson. I live at 21901 West 23rd Street South. It's just uh, west of 215th Street. Um, my property fell along the legal provisions on who had to be notified that there was a possible rezoning. I have a lot of concerns about that many homes, that many tightly, tightly, tightly packed homes going into that 92 acres. Um, water, of course, one of them. Um, we sit quite low. Uh, the edge of the property actually runs along the Afton Creekway. Um, it's uh, we barely handle the water load on heavy rain days as it is um, it entirely d it dumps entirely into uh, one of our neighbors backyards and it's, it's quite a bit when we uh, um, talked to Sedwick County about it we actually had a gentleman say that they can't go in and make the creek way any bigger because of fear of a spotted skunk habitat which is an endangered species that was quite some years ago but that was something that was alarming um, water is one problem. Um, my biggest concern is traffic. Uh, 215th Street is incredibly heavy with uh, tractor trailers because of the Dillon shipping and receiving. There are a ton of no parking signs all along 215th Street, which um, ironically are bent in half so they can park on top of them. Um, and when an officer is, we had a, one of our neighbors uh, confront an officer saying, well, aren't you going to do something? They said, well, you should go to your city council meeting um, and, and discuss that problem. So it's a real problem having traffic there. Um, something else that I'm not sure that you're aware is that on Highway 54, traveling eastbound at the intersection of 215, the speed limit there is actually 70 miles an hour. So if you're heading into Goddard, if you're heading eastbound, um, you have 70 miles an hour. If you're heading westbound on that at the intersection of 215, you have traffic that's trying to increase the rate of speed from 50 miles an hour to 70 miles an hour. Um, if there is a, if, it's, it, if it cuts down, I, it's, it's a lot. We in two, May of 2015, there was a fatal accident. Um, a young lady <coughs> with a tractor trailer hauling cattle to Hutchison. A lot of our trucks have to turn left and it creates, as you've heard, and I know you don't want to hear again, a lot of waiting. Um, but I will tell you at 
this Thursday, this last Thursday, um, which is December 16th at 8, 10 a.m. We had two semi-trucks parked on 215th Street. One semi-trailer was traveling southbound on 215th Street. An additional <coughs> tractor trailer was turning south onto 215th from um, Highway 54. We had a utility truck, I apologize, I'm almost there. We had a utility truck parked in the median trying to turn left onto Highway 54. We had one car and three trucks trying to turn right. And I have a photo of it time stamped if you have any interest in seeing this high volume of tractor trailers and it is it's the the increase of traffic would be impressive to say the least and dangerous so thank you for your time is there anybody else that would like to speak tonight someone wants yes Uh, my name is Ashley Pierce. I live at 305 Brazos. Um, my husband and I purchased our home two years ago, and the small town feel is really what drew us out here. We have four young kids. Uh, one of them goes to CDS. The other goes to Challenger. Um, we live right near the school where everything's going to happen. One thing, of course, is the traffic. Both of our kids walk to school. Our younger two, at some point, hopefully, will uh, go to these schools, and they'll be walking uh, but also, what about just traffic in general on Walnut? Um, our kids, along with all the little neighborhood kids, are constantly on their bikes. And what about all the traffic going in and out of the duplexes? The riffraff, unfortunately, because people know, people that uh, own their home versus rent their home, they value their homes differently. Um, we moved out of South Wichita and wanted to come out to the small country living. You know, we appreciate having to go into town to go to Target or anything like that because it's not here and that's what we value. Um, single family homes, maybe, but duplexes, no. That would possibly be a reason for us to leave Goddard or at least the area that we're in because that's not what we signed up for when we purchased our home here. Thank you. I'm Amanda Treadwell. I live at 410 Richards Road, right across from CBS. So the purpose of, my understanding of the purpose of today's meeting is to agree to accept a rezoning of that 92 acres to R2. So if that's the decision that's being made, I want to share with you the reasons why that should not happen. Um, the first thing is, is um, watching um, Facebook for the last meeting we don't have enough information um, to know how we're going to address the traffic how we're going to address the roads how we're going to address the flooding um, about really how many homes are going to be going in there as far as where they're going to be located and the dense population of that area so the other thing was is about um, the uh, talking about the like being able to secure whether it be 60 40 or however like them guaranteeing that well once you do go r2 it like you said it is r2 so i think that's the worst thing that you can do for that location um, myself moved here seven years ago from derby um, because the population you know it got very big and i have um, three kids and sometimes up to eight kids because of foster care um, so having that was one of the reasons we moved here is for the small town and also for the safety and that it was that small town feel just like everybody else. So obviously I know it's going to develop, um, but for this particular location, as some have mentioned that we went through this before in that particular location, um, and as everybody I think can agree, that's a difficult area just because of where it's located um, with the, the roads and who maintains the roads. Um, you got the school right there. You got the Dillon warehouse right there. Um, traffic, the flooding issues there. That is an area that needs special care and attention if you are going to develop it. Um, it needs to have all of that stuff planned out and all of that stuff presented versus it being going, well, we'll check with a lawyer or, you know, maybe we could, I guess we could guarantee this or not guarantee this. 
Like I think if, if that area is going to be, be developed, we have to have all of that information up front so that way we can have that confidence that it's going to work out and it's going to be the benefit to everybody. Um, and I don't think we have that. So that's why I say tonight we don't have enough information to say that R2 is the best thing for that area. And I think it's the worst thing because we're just jumping the gun when we don't have all of the information yet that we need to know. Um, the other part of that is the R2 zoning, who does, who does that benefit? So the R2 zoning, in my opinion, benefits really just the developers and a profit. Um, when you look at a perspective of being able to bring more people, you know, if that area can sustain and we have all the information laid out for us to possibly do single family homes, great. Um, that can also fulfill the same needs that multifamily would. You could have rentals in that area. Um, some people sell their homes, some people rent them when they move out, you know, move out of town or something, they can rent them. So you could still possibly have rental properties in a single family home residence. And with, today, with today's market, single family homes are actually being rented for the same amount as multifamily homes right now. 12, 1500 bucks, not the same as you would as a single family home. So we could still achieve that. So whatever the needs are for that and bringing, bringing people in or having homes for them, you can, the rental part's taken care of, you know, families, that's what we need. People, like everybody had said, families are wanting to move here to raise their kids and have that small town feel. So we can still accomplish that with the single family, you know, single family homes in that area if we have all the information, you know, for us to be able to do, to know that that's going to be best for that area. Um, also with duplexes, the reason they're not great is because they are difficult to maintain. You have one shared roof, you have one shared sightings. Well, both parties have to agree to be able to replace those at the same time. So that's why sometimes you'll have one side look good, one side not. Look <coughs> at the duplexes that are by the administrative building. Look how, how they look now. And that's because some are rentals, some are owned. And we don't have any control over duplexes if they get sold. Um, somebody can own one side, somebody else can own the other side. And if they're not agreeance, then, you know, it makes it hard to maintain that. And also, you're going to get out-of-state investors that, were pro that could possibly buy them, too. And so those are harder to maintain, or they, or they hire property management companies to maintain those. And then sometimes they don't do a great job. So it's just very difficult to control when you have multifamily homes in that area. Um, as far as who owns them, the maintenance and stuff. And it does affect value. Um, from, from a real estate perspective, in appraisals, um, location is key and view is key and site is key. It's actually a label on the appraisal. So, so appraisals, was two oh, was it? I'm sorry. Um, it will take it in consideration as far as appraisals and, and affect the values of the homes around the area. But as far as R2, I don't think we have enough information, so that's why I ask that you vote no um, until that information can be provided at a later time. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? Mm -hmm. From once? Yes. <coughs> Thanks, Bob Merritt. Uh, did serve on the uh, but before I go there, 2501 South 222nd Street West. Um, so I'm catty corner crossing the said, said property. Um, actually, I feel pretty good about the schools. Uh, between the 12 years that the gentleman over here served and the, the uh, two terms I served on the school board, I feel like the schools are the least of our worries here. I'm terrified by the 215th Kellogg intersection. And I uh, was very glad the Planning Commission decided against this recommend that you didn't go for it as an R2 right now until more is known about the intersection. Um, the other thing I'm curious about, there was a lot of uh, openness to discussing um, the overlay. There was an openness to discussing a deed restriction. I'd like to take that a step further and see if you can pursue with the developer uh, to get started on it and get to the 60% and get the single family homes established before the decision's made to do this. So I think what you'll find out is it won't be hard to fill. And I based that on when we were living in Tennessee prior to 2010, we lived in a neighborhood that was a three um, section subdivision with a golf course right in the middle of it. The first section was done and before the second section and the third section was laid out by the city, the golf course went in and it was a colossal help to the neighborhood filling and the city was really behind it and it was a great boon to everyone that was involved with it. 
So I would love to hear you have a conversation in the open session beyond this with the developer about other options that weren't discussed in that planning commission meeting that might um, get something going before you commit to R2. Thank you. comments and coming out here today expressing their concerns we do have a very special event tonight recognizing Doug I'll let Mike speak <coughs> thank you very much so as you're all probably aware after many years of dedicated service to the city of Goddard Doug Van Amberg um, has decided to step down and spend more time with his wife Carol and their five daughters, their one son, and three grandchildren. Also, they're all their other family members include four dogs, two cats, two parakeets, and a horse. So Doug will pursue his other hobbies like riding horses and collecting cars, a few of which include Jaguar, Cadillac, and station wagon. Doug worked at Midwest Drywall for his career, eventually being promoted to safety director before retiring two years ago. His wife, Carol, said he now works full-time for her, so I <laughs> suppose that's probably appropriate. Commission Doug, uh, Chair Doug Van Amberg, has served on the Planning Commission since 1992, a total of nearly 30 years, and has lived in Goddard or Cedric County for over 33 years. Doug has always had a passion for helping others in the community, serving many years as an assistant scout leader to his son's scout troop, and he met his wife while serving on Wichita's Riverfest com uh, Committee. We thank Doug for his many years of tireless service <coughs> and help with advancing our community. And please join me in congratulating Doug Van Amber. Thank you for the citizens of Goddard and the governing committee to let me serve and, and make some decisions and help things grow and make this a better place to live. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Item F, consent agenda. Motion to approve. Consent agenda. Motion by Larry. Second. Second by Sarah. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes. Item H1. <coughs> I will step out. Ryan, you need to grab you. Sure. Then. All right, <clears throat> item H1. This is a rezoning request for ICT development. So, quick background. Garver LLC has submitted a rezoning request on behalf of the developer Brian Legali and Kirk Richards for a proposed development on the corner of 215th and 23rd. The rezoning request would change the zoning classification of a proposed land development from R1 single family residential development to R22 family development. The purpose of the rezoning of the land would be to allow duplexes to be built within the development without having to go through a conditional use permit, a CUP for each lot, or rezoning a portion of the development as needed. The Planning Commission denied the rezoning on December 13th, 2021. Uh, with this result of the Planning Commission, the City Council now must consider the rezoning request and in order for it to pass, a supermajority of the membership must vote in favor of the rezoning request, which would be four out of five. If approved by the City Council, it would become official 30 days after publication in the City Newspaper. A protest petition was filed with the City Clerk on 12-16-2021 and it was verified. So we're going to go into 17 different factors, which comes from a legal case, Golden versus City of Oakland Park, and so we're going to draw from these factors. These are not determining factors, they're not weighed in any particular way. They're meant to help guide the conversation and hopefully answer some of the questions of those who spoke 
and there'll be some follow-up analysis presented that will hopefully answer more of those questions. So <clears throat> the following requirements are found in Article 13, Amendment Section 100.H.1-17. So what are the existing uses? And all these were, was presented to the Planning Commission as well, so they also took those into consideration. So what are the existing uses in their character and condition on the subject property and in the surrounding neighborhood? So land use to the east is farming ranch operation. To the south, the land use is single family residential detached. To the west, the land use is farming <coughs> ranch operation. To the north, farming ranch operation. There are two schools in close proximity to the east and northeast, and there's a Dillon's warehouse to the northwest. So what is the current zoning of the subject property? and that of the surrounding neighborhood in relation to the request. So the land is currently zoned rural residential since it's in the county. Directly east of the zoning is rural residential directly north, is rural residential directly south, rural residential and directly west is rural residential. Is a length of time that the subject property has remained undeveloped vacant as zoned a factor in the consideration? No length of time the land has remained undeveloped does not appear to be an over consequence of zoning. Um, we've seen a lot of development happening on regular single R1 or rural residential as it stands. Will the request correct an error in the application of these regulations? No, this is not a correction of the error through a rezoning request. Um, is the request caused by change or changing conditions in the area of the subject property? And if so, what is the nature and significance of such change or changing conditions? So yes, the city of Goddard is, as you know, experiencing a large residential influx and an increase and has been for some time now. Most of the increase is single family detached owner occupied dwellings and there is a need for rental units along with these single family detached housing. So we see the majority of it be single family detached housing and the need for rental and multifamily is on the rise. Do adequate sewer disposal and water supply and all other necessary public facilities including street access exist or can they be provided for to serve the uses that would be permitted in the subject property? The answer is yes. Petitions for specials will be submitted per the standard development process for the introduction of sewers, water, street, and stormwater, similar to other developments in the city. This is per normal standard uh, procedure. Would the subject property need to be platted or replatted or in lieu of dedication made for rights of way, easements, and access control of building setback lines? So yes, the land is currently unplatted and would have to go through a platting process. Um, the city of Goddard requires preliminary and final plats. We don't have a one-step final platting process, so it would have to be a preliminary and a final, and then the final will be considered by the city council. Uh, would a screening plan be necessary for existing or potential uses in the subject property? No, the adjoining properties are residential, and the proposed use is residential. So even if it's single family with R2 in there with duplexes or multifamily, it's still considered residential. The only time we ever really require screening would be if it was abutting commercial. Uh, is there suitable vacant land or buildings available or not available for development that currently has the same zoning as is requested? And so no, current zoning for R2 is around 81 acres. And out of that, approximately 1,946, which accounts for about 4% of available land for duplexes without having to go through a conditional use permit. So the vast majority of the land that's zoned in Goddard is R1. Very small amount is zoned R2, and even smaller amount is zoned R3. If the request for business, uh, for business and industrial uses are such need, uses needed to provide more services or employment opportunities, 10 doesn't apply. This is a residential consideration. There's no industrial uses being proposed or commercial uses being <coughs> proposed. This is purely residential. Is a subject property suitable for the uses in the current zoning in which it has been restricted? So the current zoning is a zoning classification for the county. So anytime the city annexes new land, it adopts the zoning regulations of the city that's annexing it. So currently, rural residential has its own stipulations that are for the county. The city does not have a rural residential zoning classification. So when we annex it, it defaults to R1. During an R1 um, classification, the only thing that it would allow for would be single family detached. But however, you could apply for a conditional use permit, which is considered an acceptable use with certain provisions attached to it. That's what a conditional use permit means, in which case then you could build a duplex if it passed through planning commission. 12. To what extent will the removal of the restrictions, i.e. the approval of zoning request, detrimentally affect other property in the neighborhood? So what's interesting about this one is in particular is that it's mentioning property in the neighborhood. It's not necessarily mentioning quality of life or any other specific uh, specifications per that, um, <clears throat> per that legal case. And so value is a difficult thing to determine. Uh, conversations with Jack Mannion, Cedric County Residential Land Analyst has revealed that urban and rural properties appraise differently based on infrastructure that supports those properties. So rural properties tend to decline faster <laughs> simply due to the fact that rural properties are responsible for infrastructure that supports those properties. 
and homes versus urban properties that have municipal services like sewer and municipal water. By this very metric, urban homes with a similar square footage of a rural home are valued higher than their rural counterparts due to the improvement of urban infrastructure versus rural infrastructure. So this is a little bit complicated. I'll parse this out a little bit more and feel free to ask me questions at any time, but I'll try to make it concise. Basically, you have an urban property and a rural property. That urban property has a 1,200 square foot home on a half an acre. That rural property has a 1,200 square foot home on a half acre. So they're both very comparable. The only difference is that the rural property is going to have a lagoon and a water well, and the urban property is going to have city sewer and city water. Those are considered two separate types of properties, even though they have the same lot size and the same square footage of the real estate on it. And the reason is because you have an urban property versus a rural property, and that separation of the infrastructure that supports the rural versus the urban property means that the county considers them completely separate from one another, meaning that you could have a property south of 23rd that has the same building square footage and same lot size as one just across the street inside the city and they're not appraised the same and they're not used for comparable comparisons for appraised property and this comes directly from the county and the county appraiser's office from the residential land analyst Jack Mannion who works in county appraisers. So meaning that if they were going to appraise properties in the county they're going to look for comparable county properties that are not incorporated. Similarly if they're going to look at urban properties they're going to appraise them with other urban properties meaning that a neighborhood in the city is considered an urban neighborhood in the city and it's isolated from appraisals when it relates to county appraisals and property values in the county. That was a lot. Let me take a breath there. Okay. Let's move forward. Okay. So, um, so would the request be consistent with the purpose of the zoning district classification and intent and purpose of these regulations? So yes, the use would remain residential and the city's desires to allow more residential development to occur further west outside the rural water district. So as you know, we compete for water services with the rural water district. We're pretty much um, surrounded on almost all sides except to the west. So anytime we grow or we annex in that area, we don't have to compete with the rural water district for water service rights. Every time we grow either to the north or the east or the south, we have to compete with the rural water district and we have to compensate them for basically using having those properties be serviced by the city of Potter. Excuse me. Okay, so is the request in conformance with comprehensive plan and does it further enhance the implementation of the plan? So yes, page 17 of the comprehensive plan outlines housing objectives to include, and I quote, providing for multiple family dwellings, retirement housing, and other specialized housing as required to meet the needs of defined user groups within the community. 15. Now, what is the nature of support or opposition of the request? So you've heard some of the opposition, but I'll help outline it a little bit more. Support comes in the request for more single-family detached housing to offset the demand for housing as well as desire for more rental properties in Goddard to host those who are either unwilling or unable to purchase a home in the moment. Opposition comes in desire for certain neighborhoods to remain relatively unchanged in their land use composition of single-family detached housing only or for no development of any kind to help continue to cultivate a small town rural experience which I think pretty much succinctly describes some of the concerns you've heard today. Um, is there any information or are there any recommendations on this request available from professional persons or persons with related experience, expertise which would be helpful in this evaluation? Um, being educated in city planning and urban development and having the experience of working in urban development, I have many colleagues across different states including Kansas at different levels. Um, and generally the planning practice encourages the introduction of increased density developments to help sustain commercial developments that are in proximity to residential developments while increasing walkability for health and wellness this as well as maximizing the existing city infrastructure offset maintenance costs long term also as I mentioned I speak with uh, the county oftentimes when it comes to appraisals to try to help determine value would there be a negative or positive impact and in this particular case, these are considered two separate neighborhoods, an urban and a rural neighborhood. So they're considered mutually exclusive when it comes to appraising properties. By comparison, does a relative gain to public health, safety, or general welfare outweigh the loss in property value or the hardship imposed upon the applicant by not approving the request? The de <coughs> excuse me, development is for residential use and does not pose, pose a serious threat to health, safety, or welfare by its use. And so they're not proposing an industrial textile manufacturing or anything else. This is the introduction of residential properties for people to live in. On the left, you have zoning classifications. General outline here is where that property is proposed for the rezoning. 
On the right, this is a concept plan. We have not gone through platting yet, so this is purely for concept. But as you can see here, they have an exit onto 215, an exit onto 215 here, and then an exit onto 23rd. So let's continue a little bit. On December 13th, 2021, the Planning Commission considered a rezoning request to ICT development and listened to the comments presented by individuals who spoke. After some deliberation, the request was put to the vote and a motion was made uh, was made approved. The, the motion was seconded, but it did not have sufficient support. The motion was approved, excuse me, in the, and was seconded, but the sufficient support to pass the motion failed. So the vote was two in favor, three not in favor, and one abstained. With this result, the Planning Commission and the City Council now must consider rezoning request. And in order for it to pass, a supermajority of membership must vote in favor of the rezoning request. That's four out of five, so no one can abstain. Um, if it was tabled, then the, it, it would consider the development to be expired simply because it's been extended right now for due diligence multiple times, and they can't extend it another time. Uh, with Mr. Uh, Mayor Larkin recusing himself from voting, I require all the city council members to vote in favor of the rezoning in order for it to pass. An abstaining vote is the same as a no vote, and the rezoning will not pass. After listening to the comments of the county, citizens, and city council, planning commission, city staff has addressed some of these concerns in the following slide. Orange represents the concern of purple, the answer. So one of the concerns, it was said that a low-end home would start at 175,000 for some homes. It was clarified on Wednesday that the developer meant one unit of a duplex would be 175,000. This meant that with a whole duplex, two units would be 350,000. The lowest cost home would start at 250,000 for a traditional single family detached house and will go up to there up to 400,000. How many total duplexes will there be for the whole development? There will be a total of 75 duplexes for the whole development. Duplexes are needed as part of the cash flow requirements for financing the development to justify the cost of the whole development. This is why they need the rezoning. Without the rezoning, they cannot build the duplexes and the development will not cash flow and it will fail based on these metrics. Stormwater is an issue in Kansas, and how will this be handled on this development and will it impact the county property? So stormwater detention is always required for all new developments regardless. And when the city introduces a new development, our policy is to over-detain the water such that it captures more water than before the development is there. We over-detain to help the stormwater not only in the city but in the surrounding neighborhoods as well, meaning that if there is a property that has 100 million gallons of water flowing off of it, and a development's put on there that introduces an olive impervious surface so that there's 200 million gallons flowing off that property, we would require the developer to detain upwards of 120, maybe 130 or 110 million gallons over detaining what is currently there. So it actually helps mitigate stormwater runoff off those properties. Will this development decrease the property value houses in the county? So once again, I spoke with Jack Banyan in Central County Lanny and I to ask about this and he said urban properties are considered separate and priced completely different than rural county properties. So even if the properties were considered at $100,000 across the street from the county properties, it would not impact those properties in the negative. If the properties were at a million dollars across the street from the county properties, it would not improve the, the property values across the street on 23rd. Regardless of what happens across the street on 23rd, that's considered a separate neighborhood than the property south of 23rd in the surrounding county. They're appraised completely differently. All the traffic from the new development would impact 215. So this is an interesting statement. 215 is a two-lane road, just like the 183rd. There are sort of four subdivisions that empty onto 183rd, St. Andrews, Spring Hill, Season, and Elk Ridge. And 183rd functions fine, even during peak hours of commuting to work and returning from work. I would know because I live off of 183rd. This development will introduce around 520 cars, roughly, two per unit to 215. There are over 694 cars in just St. Andrew being introduced to 183rd every day. With the season subdivision, Elk Ridge, St. Andrew, and Spring Hill, there are over 1,890 cars every day commuting to and from work off of 183rd. So if the city wanted to say that this impact of the 520 cars was detrimental enough to consider it for engineering purposes, the city would still have to annex that property into the city to re-engineer it in such a way to help mitigate the traffic flow. So it would still have to be an annex, which would mean the city would still have to annex the development next to it because state law requires that any street that's annexed, abutting properties have to be annexed as well. Concerns and answers. The school will be impacted by this development. So development, like all developments within the school district, will help USD 265 request more funding from the state since the development would be introducing more students into the district. This means it will further increase the school district's operating budget to assist with growth. Goddard has a great school district, as you've probably heard, and everyone is well aware of that. 
Uh, because of this, more developments are attracted to Goddard. So it's kind of a circle in that way. You have a really great school district. You have more developments coming in that introduces more kids. And so the question is, can it be sustained long term? Schools are a semi-autonomous entity as they're their own taxing entity, and they levy 56 mills for property taxes compared to their Goddard's 33 mills. As such, the school district is responsible for purchasing land and having citizens of the school district vote on bond issuances for new building developments. This is completely under the control of the school board and not the city of Goddard. However, the USD 265 school district extends beyond the city limits of Goddard and into Wichita. That means that if Goddard would stop all development from happening in Goddard within its city limits, it would not stop the school district from growing as Wichita will not stop growing by comparison. This question is, is not will Goddard be the one or the question is, will Goddard be the one to capitalize on the Goddard School District, which is so desirous of everyone to live within, or will Wichita? And that's really the question that it comes down to, because Wichita is capitalizing on the Goddard School District currently, as you're probably well aware, with Turkey Creek 3rd and 4th edition, Talia, and other developments around the surrounding area. Are the duplexes necessary? Can it be single family, residential, detached, traditional? I spoke with the developers, Brian Legal and Kirk Richards, on Wednesday directly to ask if this development could move forward with it just being R1, does it have to be rezoned R2? Um, the answer is the business model for the development was contingent upon the duplexes. Essentially, no vote of the city council for the rezoning would end the development as it would cease to be financially viable. And this is because duplexes, as you're aware, and as it was actually said by um, one of the comments, is du duplexes help cash flow the development, meaning that it helps offset the cost for any new infrastructure, for example, racquetball courts or anything else that the developer might want to propose into that development these actually help cash flow it, and it's part of the financing mechanism that's presented to a bank when you're asking them to help finance the development. So when you go before a bank, you have a pro forma and you have a bunch of information on there that says this is how we're going to cash flow the development. The bank says we like it, they rubber stamp it, and then they move forward with financing from the bank. Those duplexes are part of that financing pro forma. Is this development in line for our comprehensive plan, strategic plan, and, and desired growth direction? So this development is in line for our comprehensive plan, strategic plan, and desired growth zone as the city expands. It is known that the Rural Water District Number 4 competes for water rights around the city with few exceptions. This development is one of those exceptions where the Water, water District Number 4 does not exist. It's also to the west of the city, which is where the city has been inclined to grow since we are blocked on the east by Wichita, and we have seen that growth being continuing as Wichita approaches us on our east side. How does a protective overlay work, and can the city of Goddard use it? So discussions with legal team and Morris Lang have revealed that a protective overlay could be used and is used in Wichita. A protective overlay puts additional restrictions on a developer and on a development on top of its zoning classification to further restrict what can be built and how it can be built. This would include the number of duplexes that can be built in an R2 zoning classification. City of Goddard, however, does not have the option as our subdivision regulations do not give this option to be used. However, if the, if the council determined that this would be an ideal option uh, being introduced by the city at a later date, um, we could consider uh, the city adopt, uh, excuse me, that we would not be considered a petition um, of protective only, we would be considered a petition for, for, um, excuse me, for restrictive covenant. Restrict, thank you, restrictive covenant. I've been talking a long time. So we can't have the option of protective overlay, so we'd have to consider a restrictive covenant. Um, in lieu of a protective overlay, which would function in essentially the same way. We would consider a restrictive covenant. The developer would sign it saying that we're going to limit it to X number of duplexes and no more, and that could be functioned in the same way as a protective overlay. So, ancillary items, there's a small publication cost per state law. Legally, it is proved as the form. So it is recommended that the city council waive the reading of the ordinance, which is required because this would be an ordinance for rezoning, and then approve the rezoning ordinance outlining exhibit H.2B with a supermajority vote contingent upon the developer filing a restrictive covenant to the register of deeds, which has been reviewed and approved by the city staff, limiting the number of duplexes within said development to the number necessary to cash flow development. Such a covenant would run with the land for all future properties, meaning that it would run in perpetuity. So even if they did sell it, it would still be restricted based on the restrictive covenant, just like a single family detached house um, <clears throat> in the same way. At this point, having spoken plenty, I'm sure, uh, I would like to invite Chris Baum of Garver up to speak on behalf of the developer. There you go. Thank you. <coughs> You're welcome. My name is Chris Bone from Garver. We've, we've talked before. We've talked about this development for like four or five months, I think. Not in the sense of a rezone, but in the sense of the infrastructure. So we're back tonight. Um, 
Micah did a pretty good job hitting all the bases and the concerns of the of the residents of Goddard and some of the folks in the county were brought forth to you tonight. And uh, Kirk and Brian are here and they're going to be here to answer any questions you have because they can talk about the product they're going to build and, and you know how they're going to manage this development and they can speak to that because it's their development. But I would just say a couple of things and one, um, everybody, almost everybody here who lives in a home had a developer create that home space for them. A lot. Streets and a town took charge and thought it would be good that you grew and attracted people to your community because of it. There are a few outliers, people who live out and buy acreage and build their own home or what have you, and that's fine. But communities grow by the will of the community. And so tonight, you have that opportunity. You know, I don't know if they'll say it, but if you look at the duplexes, that would be up to 40% and 60% single family at general home prices. That's over $60 million. They plan on investing on that 88 acres. And I would think that they would want to protect their investment. Um, it would be a tremendous uh, asset to the city of Goddard, we believe. It would utilize some of the infrastructure that you have in place to grow the community. If there are traffic concerns on 215th and Kellogg, it sounds like there are. Those should be addressed separately. Those are completely independent of this development because they exist right now. Well, and I it's might suggest. It's Kellogg, so it's addressed by the state. Right. We can't do yeah. anything. But I might suggest that with the infrastructure funding and such that's just been passed at the federal level, some of that money over the next year or two is going to drill its way down. There are safety grants that KDOT, I'm, I'm just speaking for this, to the city in general. There are safety grants that you could pursue and an economic development since you've got a, a Dillon's distribution center. You might consider that. There could be some money available to help for some intersection improvements through KDOT. But it sounds like that pro problem exists right now. So obviously it, it's a concern for the city in that location. Um, but with that, I don't have much more to say. I'd ask uh, Kirk and Brian to come up. If you have questions about what they're going to build and how they're going to manage it, I'm sure they'll answer every question they can. So, gentlemen, questions for them? Um, I don't have a question, but I do have maybe a little input if I can start this. Is that okay? That's good. Um, so, I built my house 20 years ago. Lived in St. Andrews 20 years. Um, when I first built my house, the Seasons was still building. I was maybe the ninth house in St. Andrews. There was a field behind my house. I had mice. I'm like, wait, I don't like this country living stuff. Now, there's all sorts of houses. But when I first moved in and I would go to work, I would take Kellogg and I would drive all the way across town. When I got to Kellogg at 183rd, there was not a stop like there because we did not have the houses or the people to require the state to put a stoplight in there. So we had traffic concerns, we had issues. But with enough houses, the state came in and said, hey, we need a stoplight here. The state has now come in and said, hey, we have this Walmart, we have all these houses, we're gonna widen this road eventually. We're gonna get turn lanes. When you have more development, the state is forced to come in and do these things. Just like if the city annexes 215th, 23rd, we are now in charge of upkeeping those roads. We can come in and say, we don't want this speed limit, whatever it is, this is now a residential area, we will reduce the speed limit, thus increasing the safety of the neighborhoods, addressing those issues, fixing potholes, taking care of those things, because we have the tax money and we have we have now have annexed that property. So I know there were a lot of concerns about traffic. Trust me, I had them when I moved into my neighborhood and I realized what was going on. My son, when he started driving, hey son, you're gonna take Maple, you don't get to drive on Kellogg. That's just how we're rolling. Because as his parent, it's my job to instruct him on making good choices. So I, I fully get the concerns with the traffic issues and safety regarding that kids walk into school. I mean, if you've watched city council meetings or been to city council meetings, you know I'm constantly, why is the speed limit in our neighborhood so fast? Please do something about the speed limit. Thus we have the drive 25, keep kids alive signs that we've put out. 
So I'm, I'm all about safety. But I know once you get more traffic, more people, those safety issues actually get addressed. And we'll hire more police officers because our city's growing. So those areas will be patrolled more. Traffic laws will be easier to enforce because we'll have more coverage. So those are things I, I just, I wanted to bring that up, I guess, because that, I went through it. I grew through it with Goddard. And, and Council Member Leland, it took us three years to get the sequencing queue of traffic studies to, to actually get the, the queue for the cars turning up from 183rd onto Kellogg. It took us three years of going around and around <coughs> the TDOT to be able to get that extended over what they allowed when that first went in when yeah. the population was 24. Oh, yeah. I mean, Jana, your kid went to Holy Spirit. You sat in that line when they did put the stoplight in forever or before the stoplight waiting to turn to get out of there it was backed up all the way to maple until we as a community grew enough that it could be put in mm -hmm. <coughs> that's all i got on i'm well, just going to ask you to go over i think a lot of the concerns for the duplexes and where they were going to be placed maybe you could shed some light on where you were going to put these duplexes to where the aesthetics of them would be <coughs> to where it wouldn't be so noticeable to the people passing by. Right now, we'd be hard to put them on the inner, so it would be like in this area, uh, somewhere over here, and we'll back up in here. We'll have probably three different clusters of them. So they and they'll, they'll all be around the street the street at all. They'll all be surrounded by single families. We'll, we'll screen them for single families. No question. Can I add something to you as well? Um, you know, um, we're creating a, a neighborhood and an HOA, so all these houses will be subject to, um, in like an HOA, to be kept up and taken care of. And like Chris said, you know, we're investing millions of dollars in this community, and there's just a, a lot of people that don't want to own I mean, that's why we want to have some multifamily is there's just some people that just don't want to own if it's elderly that have a budget and just want to know you know they're paying fifteen hundred dollars a month or if it's people that are coming in and saying hey i might be working here at the school system for two years i don't know if i want to plant my feet here you know um and there's just a lot more people are willing to rent something have somebody else take care of it but we're going to have an hoa in effect to to take care of keep it you know, so what's, what's, up. what's going to be the price of a rental property if you if you rent a house? What's the cost going to be to that individual? Um, minimum probably fifteen hundred. Like fifteen hundred to seventeen hundred. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask anyone in this audience: How many of you pay seventeen hundred dollars for your home right now? Because that's what these people are going to have to pay to live in those duplexes, so that they can have quality housing. Um, I'm just going to, I've been on the council for almost 22 years now. And I was there when we put down that last one. And the reason we put that down and the reason I voted against it is because that addition was going to empty out onto Walnut. And when it emptied out onto Walnut, I saw that it was going to cause problems in that neighborhood because people were going to try to cut through the neighborhood and people were going to stop the buses from progressing. Well, that's not the case in this situation, the one I look at. People are emptying out on 215th and on 23rd. There, there is no emptying out into another neighborhood. They're emptying out onto a two-lane highway, which if it gets too clustered, we can always if the city owns it, we can always address that and widen it if we have to or whatever it requires. I mean, that's that's up to us as a city to see the traffic count, what is going to be required and to do it. We took, I don't know how many different times we've set out and canvassed the community and had dinners and asked the citizens of the community of Goddard over the past 20 years, what do you want in Goddard so we can help make it happen? And the majority of the comebacks that we had were, 
we need more rental property because we want to live in Goddard, but there is no place to live as a renter. There is no place. Earlier, there's a hundred going in south of town. The time for citizen comments is over. Oh, oh, and and, and yeah, please yeah, consider it. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Bone, implies a response. Mr. Bone, yes, uh, sir. Your your plat, I believe, in the concept uh, reflects an urban standard right of way uh, allocation. Correct. So it can handle high traffic flows in ways similar to Wichita Arterials. On both of the arterial streets that you call them on 215th and 23rd, it's a 60-foot half street right-of-way, and then you can see it expands with a corner clip at the corner. So it could, in you know, eventually, and in, in 50 years, it'll be a full-blown, you know, four-way intersection with a light there, probably at 215th and 23rd. It's a con it, it's set up to accommodate that, yes. And, and also, the, the duplexes at 167 are, are in the city of Wichita. And as you know, the city of Wichita now boundaries a full half mile north of 167th on the east side and proceeds to about a quarter of a mile south of 167th. So uh, as we look at, at growing and, and how we grow and where we grow, it also is important as we try and position ourselves so that we don't become a Westboro with respect to Wichita growing around. And as I was saying, all these comments that came in were that they wanted some rental housing, they wanted the amenities of park. What have we done as a city? I've been on the forefront of trying to make sure that everybody had green space. I don't know if you're aware of this, but that park wouldn't be down there if it hadn't have been for me. I was the one that saved that park in this downtown. And that's public record. Okay, I wanted to make sure that everyone had green space so that you could enjoy life in a small town setting. That track going up, up and down called Prairie Sunset Trail, that is something that went along with this because if you've got quality of life, you want somewhere to go and you want some place for your kids to have a good time. That's what draws people to this town. It's now the centerpiece. People love that. That's why people want to build out here, is so that they can be safe on that trail and have safe routes to schools on that trail. They can get on that, that's just almost on the trail. They can get on the trail, ride the bike into town and be safe without getting run over. That was part of what our plan was as far as a comprehensive plan. That's why we have a comprehensive plan for 25 years. How do we want to grow and how do we want to function and how do we want to make this a town safe and enjoyable to where everyone can live and feel good about being a citizen of God. And that's why people want to build out here is because they see what we have and they love it. And they want to be part of it. And so it's up to us to, to help make it happen and to keep people from Wichita from surrounding us and shutting us off to where we don't have control of 215th. All of a sudden, Wichita's got control of 215th and we can't do anything about it. That's what happens. That's what happened to Eastboro. They've got to depend on somebody else to, to make their decisions for them. And I don't want that to happen to God. I want us to be a community that is proud of what we've got and pulls together and and cooperates with one another. And I've, I've done my best over the past 22 years to, to make this place that when I leave it, I can say it's a, a whole lot better than when I found it. And I hope that when you look at the things that we've accomplished as councils, that you can see that we've been looking out for the good of the community, especially when you look at the North Park that we just got that we're developing now so that people have green space. Why is that? So that everyone here can have a place that they can recreate and feel safe. You did that by asking us questions and getting answers to problem solving, not sitting up there telling us to shut up. I never told anyone to shut this up. This is actually hey, a good job. It's a good job. It's a good job. It's not R2. But we've, we've, we're just trying to fulfill those things that were in the comprehensive plan. 
comprehensive plan says we want more rental properties because we want to live in Goddard, but we can't afford to, or we don't want to buy. If you have school teachers coming into this town and don't know how long they're going to be here, why would they buy a property? They've got to have a place to rent. Well, where are they going to rent? Are we going to make them live in Wichita, or are we going to let them live in the place where they work? That's the question. They want to live here, but there is no rental property for them to live here, so they're forced to move into Wichita and commute back and forth. And that was part of the comprehensive plan. Give them some place for renting without a big high-rise four-story building sitting there full of renters. That's what I've been trying to avoid for 20 years, is having four-story buildings sitting 20 in a row with renters. I wanted to keep it looking good and this is one way of making it look good. I've, quite frankly, I've looked at duplexes for the past 30, 40 years, not only in this town, but in the Dakotas and everywhere else, and I have not seen where renters were using duplexes, whether here or on 151st Street, that you could drive by and say they're slums. People that are in them are paying big dollar to be in them, and they've they got to take pride in them. So the only difference between a duplex, as far as I'm concerned, and a, and a single family dwelling is one wall and eight foot of property. If you stop and think about it, that's all there is. One wall and eight foot of property between the buildings. That's all there is. And we're committed to the restrictive overlay, protective overlay, whatever legal overlay or or methodology to limit the number of the duplexes because we know that's important and that's something that we've offered and whatever that looks like or however that's accomplished that's part of the equation that we offer tonight and we want it mixed use we don't want it just all duplexes I mean and this is gonna attract families I mean it's the park we're gonna have a pool we're gonna have parks we're gonna have sidewalks we're gonna have easy access to the schools I mean, that's why we've targeted this area, is to attract families and, and maybe some family members that, you know, don't want to buy or can't buy or just don't want to maintain houses. Mm -hmm. You know, some people don't even like calling a plumber or an electrician anymore, and they want to have no maintenance, and this is just a part of this <coughs> development that will be incorporated in this. And if they say, hey, we love it here, we want to, you know, we want to stay here, gives us an opportunity to build them a single family house in the same neighborhood with the same amenities. Does the council have any questions they'd like to add? Um, I, don't, I think our staff has done a good job of laying out the, uh, you know, the concerns that were the last meeting and uh, many of which were reiterated today. Um, you know, uh, being a citizen of Goddard, having grown up here, uh, sometimes in a duplex, sometimes in a single family home within Goddard, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I have a vested interest in where the city's headed. Um, my grandpa built a lot in daughter. Uh, I, I happen to live in a house right now. Um, and yeah, you know, I, uh, daughter's going to keep growing. Uh, we want to do it in the right way. Um, and I, uh, from what I've seen, the developers want to do it in a responsible way as well. Um, I don't pay 1500 a month for rent. And, uh, yeah, to, to your question that you did ask, I don't think 15 minutes a month, right? I mean, they have mortgage that that. So, for that to be considered riffraff, I, I, I don't see it. So, I think that, um, you know, the engineers, I trust their professional expertise on water management. Uh, I, I feel like this has gone in a responsible way, and it's good for them to help pay for the green space. It's going to be tax dollars to flow in. It's going to drive commercial development. It's going to drive stoplights because, yeah, it is a dangerous intersection right now. But, you know, KDOT's going to look at it and say, where's the population to change it? So, yeah, I, no, I, I agree with that. Too. Well, all our, all our citizens, the what we've heard over the past five years, is complaining about the water bill and the sewer bill. And when we built that sewer plant, it was forced on us. We didn't have a choice, it was forced on us by the state. And so the citizens of God had to eat that. <coughs> and so they tried to put in a responsible manner how to pay for that. Well, it went on a recurring 
increase over the years in hopes that the population would increase along with that so that the current residents wouldn't have to eat the whole cost of that $7 million. So now we're having an opportunity to get more population to help offset that since we're coming into that target. Correct me if I'm wrong, Harlan, but we're in that target area where the next increase as far as jump on the banks, as far as the fees would have to be, now we'd have 200 more houses to share in that expense. I think that's the way the loan's set up, isn't it? Uh, the refinance is set up to where it won't balloon like that, but it just gives us more opportunities to continue to lower the monthly bills if we can or, you know, uh, offset future increases for future expansion of the system. All right, do you think you'd like to add? I'd like to make a motion to consider this. Second. Second. A motion and a second to wait the reading of the ordinance. All favor aye. 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 Then we would need a motion and a second and then a roll call to approve the rezoning ordinance outlined in exhibit H.2B with a supermajority vote contingent upon the developer filing a restrictive covenant to the register of deeds if you so choose to accept that restrictive covenant. Um, and which has been reviewed and approved by city staff, limiting the number of duplex units in development to the number necessary to cash flow development. Such a covenant would run with the land for all future properties. I'd like to make that motion. Okay, the motion is your second. 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 Here you are, Bay Rock. I guess we get a roll call vote. Council Member Zimmerman? Yes. Councilmember Leland? Yes. <coughs> Councilmember Trailer? Yes. Councilmember Proctor? Yes. Motion carried. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Wrong. You all move. Thank you. Thank I can't you everybody. wait to re elect every single one of you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for Shame coming for citizens' you. comments. Do you have any questions afterwards? My oh, office yeah, is open. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. So this would be item H.2. So this is an annexation request. So the property owners of the land generally located at 215 23rd have petitioned the city to annex said land into the corporate city limits. This land adjoins the city limit on its northeast corner. According to KSA 12-519D, even if a street, water course, highway, railway, etc. separates the land from the city limit, it can still be annexed under these circumstances. Annexation of landowner's consent can be achieved through a petition submitted to the city under KSA 12-520A7. So this is located in the county generally at the northeast corner of 215 and 23rd. It's in the city's growth area, approximately 88.68 acres. Adjoined by definition means uh, to lie upon or touch. <coughs> So this is the property uh, in question, KSA 12-519D, 1983 legal case, City of Lenox versus City of Olathe sees this is a legal annexation, even if it's just in the one tip corner of the property. Financial, there's small costs associated with publication. Legally, it's approved as the form. It is recommended City Council approve the motion to waive the reading of the ordinance and approve the signing of the ordinance for the annexation of the previously described property into the corporate limits of the City of Goddard with a motion and a following roll call. Yeah, oh, we need to get one. Do we need one? No, oh, he still has to recuse himself okay. from this one, yeah. I'll make a motion to waive the reading of the ordinance. Second. 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 Aye. Then we need a motion and a second and a roll call to approve the signing of the ordinance for the annexation of previously described property in the corporate city limits of Goddard. Motion to approve the signing of the ordinance for the annexation of the previously described property into the corporate limits of God. Sorry. There you go. You got it. All right. Roll call. Councilmember Trailer? Yes. Okay. 
that person. Councilmember Zimmerman? Yes. Councilmember Leland? Yes. Councilmember Proctor? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, make a quick motion to take a recess for five to ten minutes. Or the two stinky posts. You can do it now. Okay, I make a motion to take a quick five minute recess. Second. All in favor? All in favor? Aye.
Three. Item H3 is the investment and disbursement agreement for general obligation bond series 2021 with Security State Bank of Kansas City. Uh, resolution 2001 was adopted by the City Council back in January 6th of 2020 uh, for the issuance of $3,485,000 in principal for uh, use for uh, within, pardon me, for use within the Star Bond District. Uh, the funds are used to finance infrastructure, including the interior connector roads authorized on May 20th, 2019, uh, and the subsequent KDOT uh, Federal Highway Administration Agreement of February, I'm sorry, May 16th, 2021, uh, and the design with Trans Systems at that same time as well that coordinated the 183rd Street project and the connector road with the RCUT and the uh, RCUT costing. Uh, I'm sorry, the connector road costing $1,500,000 with the remaining uh, allocated to the hotel's infrastructure footprint or for use uh, in support of that development. Section 5.01 of the development agreement, paragraph B, stipulates that the funds are to be deposited into an escrow account uh, with the uh, public funds being matched on a one-to-one -one basis until the $1.5 million portion is ex expended. The documentation for the disbursement mirrors the funds of the larger star bond disbursement <coughs> as well as uh, we've been working with the developer for uh, when he reflects to the bank the proper uh, dispersion of funds for their funding we're getting the same documentation as what uh, as what the banks get uh, the proposed investment and disbursement agreements with the security state I'm sorry security state was a Bank of my hometown. Uh, Security Bank of Kansas City that complies with Section 5.01, Paragraph B of the Star Bond Development Agreement between the State of Kansas, the City of Goddard, Goddard Destination, and its subsequent assignee, Goddard Sports. Uh, the agreement authorizes Security Bank of Kansas City to hold and disperse the $1,500,000 million, $1 million in accordance with the development plan and its subordinate agreements, which would be the, uh, the 1.5 million for the hotel and surrounding site. Uh, the city administrator and city clerk are the authorized representatives and anyone else authorized by the city council. The cost is $1,250, I'm sorry, $1,250 per year. We do expect uh, this to be brief as we're already, like we said, working for the distribution. So we expect it within 90 days. Uh, the agreement can be terminated in writing by a <coughs> party with 30 days written notice and then the council will be informed of draws and the status of disbursements each month in my staff report to the council when we provide an update on the star bond site uh, as the star bond uh, as, as with the star bond disbursements the expense is allocated within an escrow fund and so it's separate from the city funds and administered by a third party and it's anticipated to be a one-time expenditure for the uh, $1,250 uh, the agreement was authorized by bond council Kevin Cowan and reviewed by uh, city attorney Ryan Peck who has approved the form do you have any questions uh, for myself or City Bond Council or City Attorney on the agreement at this time. So we do have copies of all the checks and receipts and invoices. Yeah. <coughs> is this the last disbursement before completion? No, this this is for the portion that goes back to the uh, uh, the Starbond site around the hotel. The hotel. What year was it? I mean, before me, the city took out the over three million dollars. Yeah, that was back in um, 2014, I want to say. And again, it goes all the way back to the very first uh, amendment to the initial development agreement back when we were working with Goddard Destination. You guys have any other questions? Okay, motion by Larry. Second. Second by Michael. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin.
some of this came from the presentation. <laughs> Just <laughs> thought everybody was going to be here for it. Um, Big pressure. Yeah, yeah. So I don't have as much to say as Micah, but what I'm just asking for is what you've seen in the packet, um, approval for the purchasing um, per what uh, we have budgeted in our line item for radios. Um, the main reason we're upgrading these radios and just to have newer radios that don't have dings and nicks on them, but it's because Sedgwick County Communications is upgrading a system, their system, the next few years probably estimated at 2025 to a system called the P25 uh, radio operating system. Uh, that system is just obviously it's much better than what they have right now. Uh, it allows for a basic digital data transfer um, of information. It allows for encryption. It allows for GPS. It allows for a much more secure and stable and intelligent-minded radio system. Um, currently, we are in the process, uh, even since the last few years, I will each year buy um, some more radios each year to put us in compliance um, with having all uh, upgraded radios by 2025. Um, the 2021 budget, as I mentioned, was approved $8,000 for the radio equipment. We utilize a discounted direct purchasing op option through Sedgwick County to obtain the bid for the required Motorola radios, discounting our costs. Um, the cost of one portable and one mobile radio together is just over 6900 Our current fleet is at 12 and will be at 14 by adding the two vehicles approved earlier that we'll have in mid-2022. Um, the current staffing is staffed for 14 and by purchasing two more portable radios each year, we will have all the portable radios, uh, meaning the ones we carry on our body, upgraded in the four years. Um, I also plan to add additional mobile radios each year, and each mobile radio is $4,000, so I will be adding $4,000 to these uh, two new portables that we're budgeted for each year as well. Um, then that will set us to only being short four mobile radios in 2025. So with uh, the cost of this purchase would be allocated to the PD administration radios under the 210-7330 for that line item budget. And the current amount in that budget line item right now is 7,900. It's legal as approved to his form. And uh, it's recommended that the city council approve the purchase of two motor rail radios for 5,900. 56 and 76. Uh, 59 or 76? Uh, I'm sorry, 79. Where did that come from? 79, $7,961.66. So that number right there is not the actual it's, number. It's 69.46.76. That is what is left in the budget. Right. What you need. And that right there is how much it costs, 6,946. Oh. So it's a five, so it's a six. Welcome to the world of being interrupted when you're building a PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> I make a motion yeah. to approve 696676. Motion by Sarah, second by Michael. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Honorable Mayor and Council, uh, you can see the Starbond site as this is uh, looking back to the southwest with the, uh, the hotel, the healthcare facility, I'm sorry, the, uh, the gym, and then the child care facility with this uh, convex roof being the uh, water park and you can notice this, the slide coming out. And then the concave roof being the competitive swimming venue, which is currently having its concrete poured. Uh, just another view of the health club with the uh, slide set up for the, uh, the interior water park. <coughs> so uh, this is showing our, our current subdivisions as well as um, our vacancy rates within the, uh, the subdivisions within Goddard, and this is uh, Micah's numbers as of today. So 
So you can see that all the lots in Elk Ridge are sold, all the lots in Spring Hill, all the lots in St. Andrews, uh, all the lots in uh, the Seasons with uh, 60 lots available, 70 having been sold for Clover Leaf. So that development that's less than five years old, actually less than three years old, is, uh, is already 54% uh, filled. The uh, lots in green are, the, are platted at 105. And you know with the, with the rain that we had for Rusty Creek, it's taken longer because the, uh, the soil was so inundated with water that uh, it's required significant dry time, and so that set them back. Um, and you can see Autumn Blaze that has zero lots available and is completely built out. Uh, Arbor Creek, as you are well aware, um, has 245 platted lots with uh, 46 currently sold, so 20% uh, uh, of that subdivision is filled. And then, uh, as you know, we've got Governor Neighbor to the west, or east, I mean, uh, Wichita abutting us now. Uh, view of Arbor Creek and, and the clubhouse area, looking back, generally in the direction of uh, east, northeast. Another view looking back, and you can notice the, uh, the water tower there, looking in the, the same general direction. Uh, Clover leaf, you can see the phases there. Phase one being the lighter gray, phase two being <coughs> the darker gray, with the brown being phase three. And the view looking uh, south along Kellogg on the right hand photo, with the uh, photo on the left looking back to the uh, south southeast. And you can already tell there's Five foundations already underway just in this photo alone. Uh, Elk Ridge completely built out with uh, construction currently underway with uh, five homes under construction in this photo. And then Rusty Creek, which you can tell from the, uh, the darker patches of earthwork showing uh, the extent of the moisture in the soil mm -hmm. there. Uh, Dutta State Senior Home, you can see they're, they're constructing their, uh, their foundations there. And then our holiday hours uh, will be uh, half day on the 23rd, close all day uh, Friday the 24th in observance of the Christmas holiday and uh, the same pattern for uh, New Year's Eve. And some uh, Items of note that are forthcoming, we'll have our annual administrative uh, waivers that we do in, in appropriation resolutions, governing body goals, uh, budget and CIP discussion, and then in the second meeting as we do, uh, the second meeting of each new quarter, we'll have our quarterly reports, and in this case we'll focus on Q4 and 2021. Also at that meeting, uh, the uh, Tanganyika final plat, and then we'll start kind of our municipal code cleanup and some compliance and sign regulation and benefit and equity fee considerations. And we may end up having some workshops on that just for clarification or uh, discussion, or we'll have a meeting solely dedicated to that if need be. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Larry? Well, I just have to say that being council members is not always easy. I've been into I've been into situations similar to this when they came over the bypass twenty years ago or twenty two plus years ago. And there was almost five hundred people in meetings, half of them didn't want it and half of them did want it. Mm. And who's right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, why we were elected to our council to try to cipher out what would be the best for our city. We have to believe that we made the right decisions and go with it. And if we didn't make the right decision, then we'll have to try better next time. But we have to believe that 
those people that elected us expected us to watch out for their interests. Mm -hmm. And I believe that those people that elected us got their best interest in mind because they're the ones that we tried to watch out for as far as sewer rates being leveled out by the traditional housing and by putting additional houses out there or getting amenities in like restaurants like people wanted. That's what people wanted in the comprehensive plan. They wanted restaurants. They wanted mm -hmm. things to come into our town. And, and, and it didn't even happen without the extra roof towns. Yeah. And so we're just fulfilling what the citizens of God asked for in all those different sessions that we had asking them, what do you want to see happen in our city? And so I believe that we tried to fulfill what they asked for tonight. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Sarah? Um, yeah, that was not necessarily what I thought I was signing up for several years ago when I joined council. And I'm sad that we can't make everybody happy because that, that's not fun telling me. People know for you know disagreeing with people. So anyway, I'm glad that we are getting more housing in Gutter because that's what people want, and we need those rooftops to bring in the restaurants that people want. Um, on another note, I do want to say um, I was fortunate to be able to help with mint and tree and food distribution as well this <laughs> as well this year. Um, and gift distribution for Mint Tree. Every year I'm astounded and humbled by the amazing citizens of Goddard and the members of our school district. The schools and churches put on many different food, gift, tape, wrapping paper, diaper, and money drives to help the people in our community who are not as fortunate. Dan Funky shared with me several statistics from this year's drives, and I'm just gonna share a few with you. He'll give us a full update at a future meeting. Um, this year, the Goddard Community and Schools helped 117 families, totaling 310 children. Members of our community donated more than 1,900 hours of their time. Uh, when I get to go to these events, I love seeing all the youth in our community helping. Um, Lions Club, the school district, our local churches, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, high school students, um, the high school basketball team from GHS was there with their coaches helping and just seeing their smiling faces as they're helping these families and wishing them a Merry Christmas, it, it makes me proud to represent this community when I see things like that. Thank you, Sarah. Michael? Well, this wasn't a really fun one growing up on Christmas with some personal attacks being made. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, as far as who we're here for, are the, the citizens and the constituents, and yeah, five of the 19 people that got up and spoke were actually citizens. And, uh, you know, that's, that means a lot to me uh, for those five. There's also 5,100 residents in Goddard, and most of those people didn't have time to be here tonight. Um, and that's, that's why they elected us. So I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, the rest of the council could see it for, uh, for what, what the good thing was, and um, yeah, it was really fun. But anyways, I do wish everybody who came tonight a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and you know, safe driving. Yeah, yeah. It's last. Do you want to comment first? It's a long night. It's a long night. It is. It is. What do you have? That was definitely a mean evening time, yeah. It was. Oh, it's looking really good, by the way, over there. I got a bird's eye view every day there, you know. The bathrooms are almost done. You're talking about the development? Yeah. Yeah. And the shower walls are almost installed.
Well, I uh, typically I don't like to you know, ramble on and on, but I decided to run for city council. I was a young man, still I'm a young man, because I wanted to give back to my community. I wanted to try to make good decisions. Now, we're all human. People might not like you. They might, you might not make the right decision to make everybody happy all the time. But that's what we try to do. So a quote that I used to say, I was in BPA back in Goddard, and I used to say it all the time when I was competing. It's a quote by Steve Jobs. Here's your crazy ones, the troublemakers, the misfits, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, you can disagree with them, you can glorify or you can vilify them. But about the only thing you can do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while others may see you as the crazy one, we see genius. Because the ones that think they can change the world are the ones who do. Now you have a governing body that is sitting before you tonight that truly wants to change things. That truly wants to push this community forward. And I am very, very pleased to call them my colleagues. So thank you all. That's all I have to say. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Motion to recess into executive session related specifically to personal matters of non-elected personnel, KS 875-4319B1 to include the city attorney, city administrator, and chief financial officer. We will reconvene the open meeting in the city council chamber after 10 minutes at 9.20 p.m. Okay.
Motion by Larry, second by Sarah. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay.